The broadcast is now. All attendees are in listen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kirsten Wakefield. I'm the Stakeholder Outreach Liaison for McCann and Maricos. And today we're excited to have Dr. Chris Chambers, a research fishery biologist at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, present on his current research related to ocean acidification. But before we get to that, a quick look at our upcoming webinar series. This is the first webinar in our fifth series. The next one on February 25th will focus on climate change impacts, including ocean acidification, to cultural and heritage resources like shipwrecks and shell middens found throughout the Mid-Atlantic. We'll be sending out a registration link for that shortly. The three following webinars will be held monthly, but we're still working on finalizing a date for each one, so please stay tuned. Um, in March, we'll be having the Drivers of Coastal Acidification in the Mid-Atlantic. In April, we'll be having a webinar uh, updating everyone on the Mid-Atlantic State OA action planning efforts. And we're still working on developing May's um, topic and date, so stay tuned for that as well. All recordings will be posted to midacan.org on the webinars tab, so you'll be able to find those after today's presentation. So as I mentioned previously, Dr. Chris Chambers will be presenting today. Chris is a research fishery biologist at the Northeast Fishery Science Center's Howard Marine Sciences Laboratory at Sandy Hook, New Jersey. He and his life history and recruitment team study how the environment, including climate change and ocean acidification, affect the likelihood of survival, and the general health of the earliest and most sensitive life stages of a variety of marine fish fish species. His research uses first principles of ecology, life history, and inference to anticipate how fishes might respond to future environment. Today's presentation will focus on his team's research on the biological responses of early life stages of summer and winter flounder and Atlantic silver sides to ocean acidification. We'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for any questions and comments. All participants will be muted throughout the talk, so please ask your questions via the chat box. Anthony Himes, a PhD student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the Virginia Sea Grant Fellow assisting with MACAN efforts, will be collating the questions to ask at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to submit them in the chat box at any time, or in the question box, I'm sorry. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on MACAN's website on the resources page with our previous webinar series. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris for his presentation. Good, thank you, Kirsten. <clears throat> can, uh, can you see my screen fine? Yep, everything's great. Good, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm glad to be able to talk to you, uh, looking at the names list. I, I miss a lot of you, I haven't seen you for a while, but. I'm glad you're able to attend today. So what I wanna do is go over uh, a variety of things we do at the lab uh, on the ocean acidification, specifically uh, in the experimental biological effects realm. Um, but I will also wanna provide sort of a elevated 30,000 foot view of uh, the way we're approaching this. So if you have any questions, again, they're gonna be monitoring the chat box. Uh, if, if my audio, et cetera, goes out, I know I've asked Kirsten or others to let me know. So uh, let's get going. So um, yeah, uh, this is brought to you today by, uh, I'm speaking, but I have a lot of team members um, that have helped me out over the years and I wanna acknowledge their contributions to this work, both in terms of federal staff, a uh, variety of contractors, um, NOAA Hollings interns and so forth. Yeah, so let me proceed with this. Uh, yeah, in terms of funding, uh, well, this work's been supported by my uh, science center in the Northeast, um, also by the Ocean Certification Program from NOAA, uh, a variety of, again, uh, internship programs that brought some excellent summer students to my lab, either in person or last summer virtually. Uh, just an FYI, guys, uh, this is our lab right here. If you can see my mouse down this peninsula, uh, Sandy Hook, New Jersey. This is Sandy Hook Bay. Highlands are postal address in the foreground and New York City right behind us. So we're in a mixed urban uh, um, county kind of habitat that's still a nursery habitat and used by a variety of important economically and ecologically important taxa. So let me first identify what the problem is at the largest level. Um, yeah, the problem is carbon combustion and emissions. 
which is a major and dominant source of uh, atmospheric CO2. And there's simply too much of this in the atmosphere. So it happens that about a third of that um, amount in the atmosphere is absorbed by surface ocean waters, which uh, increases the level, of course, of dissolved CO2 in the ocean. And that sets in motion a shift in the um, uh, carbonate um, chemical balance equation with the net result that we have a reduction in, 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 in carbonate uh, and a reduction in pH. So for animals that require uh, a, a morph of carbonate for shell, um, shell creation or to maintain their shells, as well as other organisms that are, use uh, carbonate in a variety of ways or pH balance by itself can be consequential. So I'll be talking about the effects of these elevated CO2 and the decreased uh, pH in, um, uh, on the, uh, some of the taxa from our area. Just as background again, uh, these are uh, open ocean data from a Hawaii monitoring station over the last 50 years. There's now 60 years of data and believe me, the trajectory continues upward. Point being, the CO2 level in the atmosphere has been increasing steadily and predictably over the uh, six plus decades uh, that it's been monitored. Similarly, the ocean seawater P PCO2 has been increasing linearly uh, with seasonal variation, but linearly over that uh, period, it's been monitored the last 20 to 30 years. Along with that is a decrease in pH over that same period. Uh, and this has uh, resulted in consequences. Uh, and this elevated CO2, uh, and, uh, and the lower concentrations of carbonate may affect, not, this, not in all cases, but may affect shell deposition, the exoskeletons of a lot of the uh, arthropods that we uh, that live in the ocean waters, uh, otoliths of fish, but can also attack, uh, uh, affect, if you will, soft tissue and ecological interactions, viability, uh, rates of mortality and ontogeny, and the general health and condition of the organism. Uh, and this has been demonstrated in a variety of taxa, pteropods, where, where, where shell dissolution occurs quite rapidly in elevated um, PCO2. But uh, it's also been expressed in tropical fish. Uh, uh, clownfish is an example. A number of studies done in Australia on the effect of CO2 on uh, species in the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere on the coast of Australia. More recently, evidence is accumulating that there are effects on temperate latitude and boreal latitude uh, marine fishes, their egg stage, larval stage, and right through to settlement in some taxa. So, uh, of course, the, one of the reasons why we at NOAA, and NOAA fisheries in particular, are interested in uh, elevated CO2 and effects of ocean acidification is because a lot of the fish in our area are, are of high economic and ecological value, uh, but they, of course, have all have a complex life cycle with sensitive early life stages be it the embryos or even prior to that, gametes. I'll show you some evidence of that momentarily. Um, the larvae, the hatch from those embryos, and again, right through the larval period until uh, metamorphosis and settlement. Often it's, uh, the, the sensitivity is correlated with the, uh, the, the physiological competency, competency of the gills of young, young fish. Um, so let me uh, outline, if you will, four parts to this presentation. Uh, that reflect uh, my group's thinking about what we would like to know and how we're approaching these problems of uh, under, better understanding the effects of CO2 and ocean acidification on, on, the, on the organisms that live in marine and estuarine waters. First step often in uh, a, a new research front, and, and OA uh, work is relatively new, two or three decades, but still uh, increasing rapidly in the number of uh, studies and funding, et cetera, on that research front. But the first step always is to determine whether or not elevated CO2 has an effect, a yes-no dichotomy, does it does not have an effect. It's really a matter of demonstrating there's a response. Um, and that is step one. There's been a lot of studies that have done that, uh, and some studies do not just that, but, but even more. Um, and the second step is something that's been our, a primary focus of ours the last couple of years, and that is, um, I'm adding some complexity here, believe it or not, characterizing the biological responses to CO2 and co-stressors. So what I mean by characterizing is getting a handle on the scope of response or the plasticity of the um, organism to elevated CO2. Pointing out here, biological responses means that uh, a, a set of 
potentially covariant traits, things we measure, uh, are not uh, singly uh, impacted by CO2, but quite likely respond in a suite or a network of responses in the covariant uh, structure. And there also, of course, the effect of CO2 can be elevated or diminished by environmental co-stressors. So this complicates life and experiments, but that's, I think, where we are and need to go further, I believe. Point four, uh, certainly, uh, and as I go through these points, I think they become more difficult and challenging in terms of the, 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 the work and more diversified in terms of the mode of research, but evaluating the consequences of CO2-induced biological responses. And one can evaluate that as we have done through uh, modeling, uh, and other kinds of analyses that uh, look for uh, testing your inference about uh, what you think might be the downstream consequences of ele elevated CO2. Lastly, um, assessing the capacity of the species to adapt or evolve to future CO2 levels. So these are four different uh, types or levels of approaches using di different tools. I haven't mentioned uh, the word mechanism. Uh, most of our work is not so much about mechanism, but inference about effect the basis of that effect, the manifestation of it, the consequences of it, and the potential of the organism to respond to it. So let me get rolling here on some of our experimental studies. Like I said, we're particularly interested in examining uh, uh, the Libyan marine resources and fishes in particular of economic and ecological importance to the Mid-Atlantic Bight, but also New England. Uh, and some of the studies we've done have used fish or others have done work on similar, the same species from different parts of our region. Uh, one species I want to talk about briefly is winter flounder. Um, we, our lab is right at the northern tip of the Jersey Shore, just south of New York, as you saw in the first photograph. Um, uh, summer flounder is also a mid-Atlantic bite species. Uh, it's now as far north as around Cape Cod and down through the Carolinas. Winter flounder, of course, extends all the way up, way off this to uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, a more northerly distributed species. And third, I want to also show some results from some of our work uh, on uh, Atlantic silver side, which is again, an, an important forage fish in our region. Uh, it uh, lives in bays and estuaries um, and, and is a important species, an abundant species of prey <clears throat> for other piscivorous fishes. Furthermore, it's been a useful and important ecological model for studying uh, latitudinal variation in, uh, in, in life history features, effects of climate change, as well as effects of ocean acidification by folks at, uh, in Connecticut and uh, Stony Brook, as well as <coughs> down in the Chesapeake Bay area. All right, so let me first say a few things about some of our work on summer and winter flounder. Um, in general, we take a factorial approach, either a one-way or maybe a two-way design, where one way, of course, the one level or one factor would be CO2 at several, a handful, two to four levels, possibly cross with a coast stressor-like temperature at one to, well, one level would be a single one-way, but at the two or four to four levels, replicates uh, the treatment combinations two to six times, as well as stock the containers that we are rearing the animals in, the tanks, with a set number of embryos or larvae per container. And our protocol is fairly straightforward. We collect ripe or ripening or inducibly ripe fish from the uh, local area often, you know, some winter flounder, strip spawn them. This happens to be a summer flounder with her ova being put into a bowl where we mix under conditions dictated by the experimental design and study uh, the, uh, the eggs, the embryos, um, uh, we st often stock them. In fact, sometimes we flood the, the gametes with treatment water. So we're looking at the effects of elevated CO2 from gamete onward and rear the animals uh, in a container like this. You'll see more about this in a minute. Study the larvae and we may measure a variety of uh, life history and ecologically relevant responses from gametes to embryo, larval ontogeny, and some histopathology and some of our summer flounder work. So as an example of the kind of apparatus we have, this is our version one of our CO2 system, um, a, a nice clean diagram where we have uh, vertical pipes uh, that have different, um, oh, I'm sorry, different amounts of, of um, different amounts of uh, CO2, CO2 gas infused into these vertical pipes and they supply water uh, at different concentrations to containers that hold eggs or larvae in one or several water baths. Typically using this design, we often had a two or a three CO2 level design and one, two, uh, three or four different 
temperatures. So as a yeah, two-way factorial, small, demonstrating the effect, if you will, of their motivation. Here's what it looked like in reality. Vertical pipes, uh, water is treated up above, supplied to these vertical pipes, gases are infused, uh, counter current infusion through these pipes. Water is then supplied to these water baths in which are containers that control our animals. Here's a look under the uh, hood of a water bath with in operation, inflow lines, rearing containers. Um, and here's a look inside one of the lids of those containers. Um, there's a the inflow line outflow is on a on a T with a two different heads, so we can clean off a mesh covered head when it's not in use. There's one underwater right now for outflow. This is the A container. Well, yes, it is a, it's a Mr. Coffee filter with a, a tube being used for flotation. When the larvae hatch out, they're placed into the larger eight liter volume uh, rearing container, and then the project measures and quantifies and take samples uh, by design, you know, periodically. And here's a typical plot of the pH values of, over the course of an experiment in our earlier versions of this work. Uh, so for summer flounder as an example, uh, we studied the effects of um, the embryonic period duration and found that uh, from the duration from fertilization to hatching, uh, CO2 on the x-axis, survival to hatching on the y-axis had a dramatic effect, even at intermediate uh, uh, values of the, our treatment level. This is a fairly extreme uh, range here in this first experiment. Uh, had a dramatic effect and in, in, a dramatic negative effect on the uh, hatching, uh, survival to hatching of, of the summer flounder larvae. pHs are shown here in the, in the inserted box. Um, we also looked at the effect of uh, elevated CO2 on size and shape and ontogeny. Here are examples of larvae at day zero post-hatch where the various measurements, lengths, body depths, yolk sac size, oil globule size that we would take. Here's an animal four weeks later uh, approaching metamorphosis where the you know, yolk sac, of course, is no longer being measured, but new, new features are not only depth, they're increasing in, bo in body depth, but also jaw length, eye diameter. Um, back here, you have this V, the yellow V you might see. Uh, we measured the flexion angle, which is a Flexion, of course, is a precursor to settlement, which is in some taxa, it's easier, easier to score that. And it is a continuous variable, which makes it sort of nice and score values for those variables. And so here's the kind of, given these uh, you know eight or so different uh, linear measurements, we would reduce the dimensionality by plotting them in, in PC space, principal component, axis one, uh, left, right. And most of these variables are off to the right here, standard length, fork length, body length, uh, uh, mandible length, depths, and so forth. So all these are telling us something similar, and we call that size. And this one is our, almost orthogonal to the PC1 axis, which is uh, a different uh, thing. We call it development because that FA represents flexion angle. So the data we uh, scored for this particular study were PC1 and PC2, or size and development. And here's the kind of results that we got. I was showing here four panels with A, a B, C, and C, the different ages, 0, 14, and 28 days post-hatch, all using size, PC1 score as the y-axis. And we see the animals are actually smaller at lower uh, CO2 levels, longer, longer at, at high CO2 levels. That continues through midway through the uh, larval period. By the 28th day, uh, flexion is beginning. The more advanced animals are approaching metamorphosis. We find maximum size at intermediate CO2 levels. This continues, by the way, <clears throat> at later time, this, this <coughs> distribution, this, the size of the lowest CO2 animals actually is largest ultimately at settlement. Panel D shows PC2 uh, score or development. And what this means is that here uh, uh, in this scoring scheme, the more developed animals actually have a negative displacement from the zero axis. So the high CO2 animals have a more advanced in development and less so as the CO2 level decreases. So what's going on here is animals under high CO2 levels are developing more quickly. They're longer early on. We didn't weigh them, so they can't comment on the weight, but longer early on, and they settle <clears throat> earlier and at smaller sizes, which must have ecological implications in, in terms of the, uh, uh, in that, the natural environment. Here I'm showing data on summer floundering effect of uh, CO2 crossed with temperature on fertilization success. And what we see here, <clears throat> summarizing the ANOVA, is that PCO2 has a significant negative effect 
lower fertilization fertilization rate that had higher CO2, lower pHs. These uh, magenta colored uh, lines represent uh, reference point 7.9 pH, the change in percent fertilization with uh, increasing CO2. The key, the key points here are that uh, the PCO2 effect <clears throat> results in fertilizations lower <clears throat> at elevated CO2, and that uh, there's a PCO2 times temperature interaction. And also, and this is fairly consistent across these, our studies, a uh, PCO2 by female or a parent interaction as well. Uh, similarly, on winter flounder, which again, uh, more, more uh, coastal spawning species, uh, for the most part, with some offshore spawning, such as Stelbeck and Bank, we did do some contrast between those uh, spawning habitats. I'm just showing you now just the fertilization data for winter flounder, like you saw in the earlier plot, <clears throat> where we've crossed um, CO2 level with temperature, four levels of temperature to four levels of, of um, um, CO2 or pH. The ANOVA table shown here. The upshot is that there's a <clears throat> significant PCO2 effect. In this case, it's a different pattern though than with summer flounder. And this is an inshore spawning species. Summer flounder spawns offshore. <clears throat> Fertilization peaked at intermediate CO2 levels. Remember, summer flounder it was decreasing as, in, as CO2 levels increased. Furthermore, there uh, once again was a PCO2 by temperature uh, interaction. Um, okay, what are we doing about characterizing the response? How do we get a handle on the plasticity, both the the range of sensitivity and the scope or the shape of that response across across space. Um, one can imagine that uh, a phenotypic trait might have a variety of different, potentially potentially a variety of shapes. Uh, you know, uh, for different traits, it could be no effect, i.e., horizontal line, no slope. Uh, uh, it could be negative or positive slope and linear. It could be nonlinear. It could be uh, unimodal. And some of these patterns just suggest the, 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 the amount of ways it might vary. If you do a study where you plot, uh, in planning purposes, response versus environmental factor, often you don't know the shape of the underlying environmental factor for some of the responses we're interested in. Some you do, you know, temperature effects certainly are, are they're, they're directly related to the rate of living. But let's say you run an experiment where you didn't know the shape of this, this function and your three treatment levels are shown here by arrows. You were smart enough to try to uh, cover maybe 90% of the range of possible uh, uh, viable responses. But the responses come out something like this. One might assume there's a linear increase uh, in the response across the uh, environmental factors, say it's CO2 or temperature or dissolved oxygen, whatever the environmental factor might be. Uh, not a very good estimation of the underlying feature. And if one's modeling these um, processes, not a very good uh, set of information for one to uh, capture what's, what might be going on at the underlying biological level in nature. So what we try to do is design systems we call them high treatment frequency or high frequency systems that can allow us to examine the whole shape of a response. And yeah, so what we've done, and these of course, these high frequency systems, we use curve fitting linear or nonlinear regressions to fit the, 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 the um, data. So it's no longer con constrained by um, replication, if you will, and, and, and independence of observation. So it at least gives us some freedom and more power if we know there's going to be a directional change, especially. So depending on the size of the container, our system can supply up to 22 different CO2 levels if we chose to go that way. 14 is listed here because that's the size of the container that fits into our water bath. We'll see it in a second. Some of these studies, we use co-stressors at two or three levels, temperature or dissolved oxygen. Again, stock the uh, container at the prescribed standard way for what we do. And here's a diagram of our system. CO2 water is stripped with the membrane contactors and flows into this horizontal pipe. That's a clear PVC pipe about uh, four feet long, four inches in diameter. CO2 is released at that air diffuser. And as the water moves downstream, of course, the gas is invected, but diffuses. So each one of these numbered 20 ports has a hookup of tubing and controller microvalves supplying water to rearing containers that lie again in the water bath underneath this uh, hanging uh, manifold system. We also have an upstream tap and a downstream tap. So we actually have 22 different uh, choices uh, to evaluate in terms of system, system performance. Uh, okay, 
here's what the system actually looks like. Again, the pipe, the connection, the tubing to the underlying 14 containers, overflow, water is collected and either goes to drain or in a RAS or recircling system. It's taken back up to our water treatment plan, uh, platform above this and returned to the system. Uh, and, and yeah, so in this case, like I said, this particular situation where we have a water bath that fits, there's 12 containers are shown here. Sometimes we can fit four, we use 14 containers. But for systems like, for instance, if evaluating the effect of uh, elevated CO2 on gametes and viability, all you need, really need is a, a 100 mil beaker. So in principle, we can use all 20 plus one plus two, 22 different uh, choices of CO2 levels, which is great. It sort of really frees us from the uh, no longer being able to depict the uh, uh, plasticity of the response. So here's the kind of performance the system provides us. Here's pH in the left axis um, and distance from the diffuser, diffuser at 0 0.0, centimeters downstream to outflow, back upstream to the inflow. And here, I think 22 are plotted here, but the point is that uh, for our purposes, for this next set of data I'm gonna show, we used this triangle, the used experimental for pH. We like this particular combination. I believe it was uh, eight bubbles per second in terms of a flow meter of uh, CO2 gas and um, four liters per minute of water. It was a combination. Uh, so for this first test of the system, we used Atlantic Silverside. We caught it locally using beach stains. Here's some adults. They're important forage fish in our area and throughout the uh, east, eastern seaboard of the U.S. and up in the southern Canada, Nova Scotia. We collect milt, extrude eggs. They, they have chorionic filaments. They stick to screen, uh, flood the uh, gametes uh, with the appropriate treatment water, if that's the, called for in the design, and, and look at the offspring's growth and development. In this case, uh, we could actually put multiple concurrent experiments in our, in our eight liter containers. These are three inch diameter PVC pipes. The mesh here you see in the container, those have eggs attached to it. And we'd have a, we had in this case had two different uh, experiments underway concurrently. And here's an example of some of the, the data we would receive. Size of hatch and length, again, total length uh, in millimeters. Um, this would be the mean of the animals in a, in a given container across the PCO2 level. And there's a significant uh, polynomial fit to this, meaning that animals are maximal length uh, at intermediate levels of CO2. And I don't know, guys, if you think about drawing three points at random, would you be able to capture that shape with two or three or four points? I don't think so. So again, important to, to cover the scope of response but also have a high enough treatment frequency to have the degrees of freedom and the power to detect uh, subtle or uh, more uh, obvious changes in shape. In fact, here's another experiment where we uh, use the same animal, same containers in the, uh, that you saw before, six of them were matched with six in another, a second uh, high frequency system where the water supply to that system had, was a low uh, depressed dissolved oxygen, I believe it was 30, around 30% of saturation. And what you see here is size of hatch in same same pattern, but there's actually an increased uh, uh, effect, an added an interactive effect. It's poorer or smaller length of hatch at low DO, but even more so at higher PC2 levels. Okay, evaluating the consequences of uh, CO2 induced effects. Well, one has several options here. What we've been doing, we being uh, uh, Klaus Huber and Kenny Rose and I. Uh, using some of our lab-based empirical data to uh, capture uh, processes of interest to us, uh, uh, early life history focus uh, uh, with several, I think, I believe four uh, different responses were included in this uh, explicit uh, daily, even hourly uh, interval, first year of life uh, component of the, of the model that fit into an adult component and allowed us to look at the effects of CO2 and thermal scenarios as well and assess the effects at the population level using population production parameters uh, like spawning stock biomass or stock and recruitment. And I'll show you one figure from that paper that's in review. Um, here we, Klaus refers to the, the spin up period of the model. Here is where the uh, CO2 effects were invoked and are monitored for uh, 40 or so years. Different line types show the different uh, um, factors, reference being baseline without CO2 effects, smaller size of settlement, 
decreased fertilization, increased fertilization. This is the data from the winter flounder work. Uh, smaller size of settlement and decreased fertilization. So there's a bivariate response of these next two. Malformed, again, some of our data on the histology from um, summer flounder show there's a clear effect on the histology and cranial development at elevated CO2. So we, have, we are assuming that impacts survival of those individuals. Slower growth, faster growth trade-off, um, meaning higher growth and higher mortality, possibly a compensatory effect there. And then severe is a word that uh, Klaus uses to characterize the situation where all four biological responses are negative. Uh, and, and so, so it's this positive covariance <clears throat> among the um, responses explicitly in, in folks in the model. And that severe situation leads to the worst scenario. And my intake on that is this is actually close, closest to reality. We expect the, we expect the <clears throat> different response variables to, to co-vary, not be independent, but to co-vary to be all to be somewhat sensitive or largely sensitive to CO2. In this case, by the way, the actual magnitude of deviation from the mean in terms of the in, in, in invoked explicit uh, terms to capture these different effects are pretty modest. We're talking five, maybe max 10% difference from the mean. And as this plays out, we see a reduction in spawning stock biomass over that period, as well as a reduction in the uh, poorer recruitment as well, another, another measure of the outcome. Okay, how are we assessing the uh, ability or the capacity of the animal to adapt to elevated CO2? We're using uh, traditional uh, quantitative genetics uh, mating designs, uh, also called the animal model, but this also applies to plant quantitative genetics. So it's a it's a ecological genetics design where we do controlled matings. In this case, we use paternal half sib crosses where each male is mated to multiple females. And we replicate the half sib groups in our different CO2 regimes and estimate the parental effects and estimate variance components from that. Uh, those ANOVA components uh, that you get in a nested analysis of variance design. Um, in this case, we're, we applied this first Atlantic silverside um, where we had uh, each of 12 males, made it to three females, uh, reared in triplicate under two different CO2 regimes and estimated parental effects and so forth. <clears throat> As a summary plot, I'll show you this. Let me explain this plot. Size of hatch is what we're showing as the response variable. Across the bottom x-axis is female number. Again, it should be from one to 36. Male numbers across the top uh, uh, x-axis, one to 12 males. I'm only choosing different colors, red and black, to help you separate what were male one's offspring versus male two's offspring versus male three offspring. Each one of these symbols is a mean standard error. Um, the unfilled symbols are the low CO2 uh, treatment. The elevated CO2 treatment is shown by the filled, either black or red. And what we see, of course, is, uh, well, not of course, if you haven't seen this before, it's variance. And the way we characterize this in the ANOVA is that uh, there was a, uh, you know, let me call it marginally significant, but a, a 0 0.056 effect of CO2 on size of hatch across these different families. The model itself accounted for three quarters of the variance seen on the, amongst the uh, replicate means. There was a significant male effect, which um, suggests a um, likely a, 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 a heritability, um, <clears throat> Non-zero heritability may be being expressed, and there was a significant female within male effect. Uh, we're working on the uh, variance components estimates here uh, that follow next to give us that handle on heritability and a standard error amongst the heritability estimates. Um, yeah, so let me summarize what I've gone over. Um, the, Evidence from the literature uh, from uh, individual reports as well, well as, well as meta-analyses show that the biological effects to elevated CO2 varies among taxa and it varies among the responses cho chosen to be measured by the investigator. In our case, as an example, uh, fertilization rate uh, decreased under uh, increasing uh, CO2 in summer flounder, uh, but increased in those maximal intermediate levels uh, in winter flounder. Uh, uh, revealing effects uh, in uh, both cases of, of CO2, temperature as a co-stressor, parents as well as interaction terms. So it's it's complicated, even under fairly straightforward uh, responses and questions about 
two environmental factors. The size of hatching, in this case, the data I showed you for, for Atlantic silverside was maximal at intermediate CO2 levels. Uh, but in the flounder case for summer flounder, a truce as well for winter flounder, flounders at settlement tended to be younger in terms of uh, calendar age and smaller or specifically shorter at elevated CO2 levels. Again, this may affect the, um, the match mismatch in terms of uh, what prey and predators are uh, in, in, the, in the, both the pelagic larval habitat and the benthic um, juvenile habitat, as well as the importance of uh, timing uh, and for instance, the summer flounder may be met, more likely to metamorphose, metamorphose and, and ingress inshore prior to winter uh, than animals uh, uh, maintain that they get the experience in a low, lower CO2 level and uh, less likely to reach uh, settlement climax before winter. They're an autumn spawning species, by the way. Um, third, the greatest uh, effects of the CO2, uh, at least as revealed by the uh, individual based model that we used occurred when um, there were, you allowed positive covariance amongst the, uh, the traits. Um, the most important trait singly, by the way, was, was the effect of high CO2 on, on growth. And it was, it was expressed in our model by metabolic uh, efficiency. And that, that's how we captured growth. Um, parentage uh, in all of our analyses to date plays a consistently important role in the uh, response of offspring to elevated CO2. So what's next uh, for us, maybe, but also for the community. And if I can speculate, uh, I, I, I believe as a group, uh, we need to uh, have a strategic, uh, thoughtful increase in the number and type of species evaluated. Some species might shed more light and lead to stronger inferences about effect if they're selected carefully. They might be the populations within a species at the edge of the geographic range or those species inhabit a stable offshore habitat or conversely an inshore variable one and perhaps um, uh, analyze those data not so much in absolute terms of the value and the response but the uh, numbers of standard deviations of response that uh, the effect size basically but the standard deviations of uh, displacement from the average we need to uh, broaden uh, and standardize response variables in, in our studies broaden in the sense of um, you know, who would have thought that elevated CO2 would have an effect on uh, uh, the neurology and the asymmetry and left right, uh, left right and handedness of animals that evidence is that does in some cases. Uh, standardizing responses, we're currently working with a team to try to standardize our metabolic C um, oxygen consumption response to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples when we compare across studies. Third, uh, a more complete assessment of plasticity is in order and um, be glad to share details on the high frequency system, which currently, as Beth, my, my supervisor knows, I'm working on a manuscript on that right now. Beth, I know you're online, so wait, you're going to be seeing that very soon. Fourth, evaluate other concurrently acting stressors. I mentioned already several thermal regimes, dissolved oxygen. A lot of the inshore tax that, that we work with are exposed to uh, toxicants. Um, and you know what, guys, it, 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 this whole the issue of point, point three about plasticity, in many ways, you can think of the effects of response to CO2 uh, akin or analogous to um, dose response studies in uh, ecotoxicological work, where the response shape and the various features of the shape, the median or the quartiles, are what's critical, or the, the lower percentiles, the, the lowest 5% or up from 5%. Uh, point being, uh, there's a lot of benefit. Uh, to looking at other literatures and how other people have approached this kind of problem of phenotypic plasticity, whether it be in animals, plants, toxins, CO2, a lot of commonalities that I think we can benefit from uh, sharing and talking about that kind of information and those different approaches. Um, fifth, uh, incorporate the uh, experimentally derived traits and rate estimates into dynamic recruitment models and importantly, vulnerability assessments. Let's get some realism uh, as best we can into these kinds of, of models because it's it's critical. And uh, as even though our IBM was a yes, no dichotomous demonstration of effect kind of model with these scope of response studies, um, among other benefits, uh, that allows us to estimate the functional form of the response and that functional form can be inserted into the model of the appropriate process that's being described. And lastly, 
Um, and there are just only a handful of studies to date. I'm thinking about Malvisi et al. on Silverside up at uh, Stony Brook and a few others, but very limited to assess the adaptive potential, i.e. the heritability. What's, this, what's the genetic scope for response for evolutionary change in response to elevated CO2 and co-stressors? So with that, I think I'm ready for questions if you have any. I haven't really been watching the chat box, sorry folks, but be glad to try to answer your questions. Great, thank you, Chris, for that talk. Um, we do have quite a few questions that have come in, but please feel free, anyone in the audience, to continue um, putting questions in uh in the questions box uh so for our first question um it's were these lab experiments at relatively constant phs and how do you expect the larvae particularly silver sides which inhabit dynamic estuarine waters to yeah. respond to variable ph levels for instance cycling from algal blooms yeah gosh yes um the, the studies i showed you were at constant um co2 levels um the nice thing about the high frequency system and the actual the PVC inserts, the egg baskets I showed you in that one image, is one of our studies. We actually every 12 hours moved uh, the, the you know, some some containers stayed where they were. Some of those ba egg baskets, others moved across a midpoint. So you're getting a small or a very large extreme fluctuation uh, of experienced CO2 levels. Uh, to imitate, um, you know, day night and uh, you know, differences um, in that case. So, so there are ways. Uh, and again, uh, to answer the question more directly, yeah, variance makes a difference. Um, uh, but then variance is appropriate also for some tax that experience that kind of variable environment. In that particular case, the differences that we saw was at a variable regime, it took longer to hatch than at a constant regime. Uh, there was a change in survival, I believe, that at, at more variable regimes caused, uh, led to higher mortality. So yeah, to answer your question, ours were, very, ours were constant for what I showed. They've been variable for silver side. Uh, we haven't tried the variation in CO2 levels for our flounder work as of yet. Yeah. Okay, for our next question, um, they ask, can you please explain how you justified using a second order polynomial to capture the underlying process or believe it is best fit rather than a linear regression? In particular, they're referring to slide 25. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. In, in general, uh, what, what I, how I approach that, folks, is I take a polynomial approach uh, and and drop off the higher order terms that are not significant until it, if indeed it, it it resolves and is best explained by a linear approach, the third or second order term would drop out, and we have a linear as best fit, or maybe a linear is not a maybe there's no slope. So it's it's sort of, if you will, it's, it, it's a stepwise regression with polynomial terms as the step unit, if that makes sense. Okay, um, the next question is specifically referring to slide 26, and they ask, what's the abnormal bump that they see on the data for years 2001 and 2002? Yeah, uh, 26 is the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> sorry. Um, Gosh, you know, I can't, I can't recall uh, specifically. Uh, it's in, it's in the paper. Like what, what went on in that particular year? It may have been a change in environmental conditions. I don't know if Klaus is on, but I, 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 I can't. Let me say this. As you saw in the, in the, in the, in the slide, it, it is consistent. Let me actually give you the, the, uh, shoot, the benefit of going back. Oh, there we go to that slide. Um, yeah, the, in, in 2000, there clearly a consistent bump across all responses. And I honestly can't recall if it's a thermal effect in that year or not, sorry. But, but by the way, thermal, thermal the, the, the role of the uh, <clears throat> explicit thermal regimes uh, was greater than the effects of CO2 in, in, in this model in terms of its performance. But uh, CO2 added, it may, if you will, it made things worse than thermal alone. Okay, um, our next, this is more of a comment um, I think they'd like your um, opinion on. 
Um, one might argue that flounders metamorphizing and settling sooner might have an advantage since while they are in the plankton, they are more vulnerable to predation compared to when they're buried in the sand. Um, is that how you would interpret anything here or? Yeah, yeah, you know, whoever asked that, thanks for the question. My, my response is one could interpret it either way. And I'm sure the question person asking the question probably could argue the other side as well. In this case, uh, it was for uh, summer flounder, and uh, you know, again, metamorphosed flounder uh, live in a 2D environment for the most part. Uh, and in this part, in this species, summer flounder, they ingress and they, they would experience a, a winter temperature where it might be, you know, again, two, three, four degrees C at worst uh, down in that part of the range. Um, yeah, the pelagic larvae may be more at risk. And I, I guess to, to answer the question more directly. Um, that kind of study is the follow-up study. I mean, I, I, I'm only, you know, I guess you can't see me. I'm sort of arm waving right now. And I would say that that needs to be assessed. Is that a benefit or a, or, or, or a negative consequence of more rapid ontogeny for that species? And the answer might differ for different species and perhaps even for different years. So, you know, once again, it's, it's complicated. We, we're providing evidence of what could happen, not necessarily the uh, the ultimate consequence of that. Great. Okay. Um, for our next question, it's can fish acclimate to different pH levels uh, with time as they can with different temperatures? How much individual or population plasticity is there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well. I would say uh, uh, considerable and varies among species in terms of plasticity. Uh, I would also say that, uh, sure, we're seeing some level of, of um, uh, acclimation, meaning they, they, they clearly can withstand a, a, a different, somewhat different, or in, in some cases, uh, we found variable CO2 environment before they start exhibiting effects. And those effects go from undetectable to detectable to lethal. So, so you know, that's a that's a that's a difficult one to, to address. The things we measure do show that spectrum of no effect to modest to large to lethal effect at extremes. Okay, uh, for our next question. Um, how worried overall are you about the future of the species you studied here? Yeah. Uh, right. Boy, you're asking me for a very broad, broad question. Uh, uh, I would say the particulars are important. Um, if, if an animal is already uh, constrained um, in other ways, this adds a burden to it and, and reduces the population uh, um, um, status, if you will. Again, I'm picturing an animal, say, that, that cannot escape in space, meaning it, 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 with war warmer temperature, it may be blocked from going further north. And throughout the range uh, of the species I'm talking about, typically um, the more northerly latitudes likely are gonna have more extreme changes in CO2 level. So I see a reshaping of the population distribution. I see a, also a change in the, in the um, production of the species. Um, e extinction, nah, not yet, but su suppression, yes. It's, and, and one more point, uh, clearly some species due to their natural habitat, like silverside is one of the questions before was addressing, um, they experience a, CO2 regime that might go from again open ocean CO2 this you know what four four twenty or something like that but microatmospheres um, um, CO2 uh, my, uh, in 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 um, some of these estuaries varies um, between five hundred or so maybe lower to several thousand on a daily basis in late summer during the course of a day night cycle so. Those species that live in those um, um, uh, habitats are already capable of tolerating those kinds of extremes. Uh, the, the problem really is, uh, especially for species that live in more, if you will, stable habitats, 
um, as they get pushed outside of their uh, envelope, and that envelope is defined by what have they evolved to uh, respond to. And if change is too rapid, and if there's not the sufficient heritable variation in, in the, the key traits, uh, they might be in a um, extinction corner, you know, not be able to respond to that change in CO2 levels. Okay, uh, for our next question, um, they were asking if you have any thoughts on possible contributions to our understanding of ocean acidification impacts based on field based surveys or if there's too much noise in the natural systems. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't know if this will uh, satisfy the, the person asking the question, but, but. Uh, uh, to me, uh, what is needed is uh, real-time, <laughs> high-resolution context. You know, what are these animals actually experiencing, either in an estuary or being in, it, in the uh, the uh, the bottom um, uh, near bottom habitat, in the benthic habitat on the shelf or other locations? Um, uh, right. I, I'm thinking back to the original uh, sort of planning documents and advice from uh, of groups in terms of what, how should we approach this problem? And I sort of laid out that sequence in terms of inference. First, we want to demonstrate an effect. Well, uh, some 10 years ago or so, I recall when um, the first guidelines for best practices came out from a European group, the POCA, um, they called for uh, you need you know three treatment levels and the highest one should not be above this and, and it was sort of if you will tailored to what we understood at the time and what we understood at the time was primarily based on those long term records or meaning open ocean records not so much the reality of what happened inshore and and also in these micro habitats such as uh, the benthic. Uh, uh, layer right above the uh, the substrate where a lot of the ground fish, flatfish, and juveniles spend a good part of their lives. So yeah, I guess to be uh, re the wish list would be real time in situ micro uh, um, context in terms of location uh, uh, for CO2 um, temporal and spatial profiles to have a better handle on what animals are actually experiencing. I wonder. I've not, I've not seen this yet, but it'd be great, wouldn't it? Be to 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 have a uh, monitoring device that you could put on a fish <laughs> and let that tell you what habitat it experiences. Anyway, that's my answer. Okay. Uh, the next one's a quick one. Um, will the silver science work be coming out in journals soon? Yeah, we have three manuscripts on that with a study um, on uh, the overall response to the. Uh, regimes, but the constant and variable regime uh, to the system, the high frequency system description, and also the, a push to uh, emphasize the importance of phenotypic plasticity and better understanding the effects of environmental stressors on, um, on the organism's response to those stressors. Um, okay, a more broad question here. Um, what are your thoughts about communicating the findings of OA studies to a public audience, given that there is uncertainty about adaptation, interactions with coast stressors, et cetera? Yeah, it's a challenge. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to see we have such a diverse audience here for this. <clears throat> and coming at this from a, um, you know, scientific perspective, <clears throat> how I have been trained, um, but let me just say, nature works uh, in the way, the, the central, central principle of nature is variance. And so we almost always have to deal with probabilities and likelihoods. So what we're trying to do is marshal the best available inference tools, be it experimental design, methodology, statistical test to convey a result. Um, so I, I say, uh, and especially in this time, isn't it true? Um, the, the communicator and the person listening have to be patient and uh, work towards a common understanding of what the truly best practices are. Uh, and, 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 and from there, again, from a scientist's perspective, I'm always interested in how we might improve uh, our means of collecting the data or interpreting this data. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moving, growing, strengthening, 
position as more data and more researchers and more ideas become available and coalesce to try to address these complex problems. Okay, uh, with that, I think I got everyone's questions. I apologize if I missed anyone as there were a lot coming in there. Um, but with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Kirsten, to wrap us up. Thanks so much, Anthony. Thanks for moderating the questions. Um, so it looks like we're at the end of our time for today. Chris, thank you so much again for sharing your research with the Macan community. I think we all have a greater um, understanding of the complexity in evaluating biological responses to ocean acidification in fish. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And just a reminder that the webinar recording will be available on our website shortly at minican.org. And we look forward to seeing everybody at our next webinar in February. So thank you and have a great day.